Seven, ten, nine, eight, seven, six. Go for main engine start. Main engine start. Two, one, booster ignition and liftoff of the space shuttle Discovery, returning to the space station, paving the way for future missions beyond. Uh, space, space shuttle traveling already well in excess of 100 miles an hour. Houston now controlling the flight of Discovery. The space shuttle begins the journey back into orbit. Discovery completes its role. The shuttle now heads down wings level for the 8.5 half of the orbit. Discovery's three liquid fuel main engines now throttle back to 67% of rated performance, reducing the stress on the shuttle as it breaks through the sound barrier. Discovery already three and a half miles in altitude, one and a half miles downrange, traveling almost 750 miles an hour. Everything looking good on the bird. 57 seconds into the flight, engines beginning to this rev up. Rob Davies at Johnson Space Center in Houston as he walks us through this, and as you can see right there, we have an estimated sense of the trajectory based on previous launches, so you can get a sense of how quickly and how fast they're moving and how fast their altitude is increasing. The throttle up call acknowledged by Commander Steve Lindsay. And Discovery Houston, it's expected day to hit it'll clear shortly. Copy. Lindsay joined on the flight deck by pilot Mark Kelly, flight engineer Lisa Nowak, and mission specialist Mike Fossum. Mission specialists Pierce Sellers, Stephanie Wilson, and Tomas Ryder of the European Space Agency down on the mid-deck. Ryder headed for six months on the International Space Station. One minute, 47 seconds into the flight, 22 miles in altitude, 18 miles downrange, traveling 2,600 miles an hour. Standing by for solid rocket booster separation. The solid rocket booster separation is a point where every astronaut breathes a little bit easier, and that is going to happen uh, very shortly. It's the first two minutes and 15 seconds. Solid rocket booster separation confirmed. Guidance now converging. Discovery's onboard computers commanding the main engine nozzles to swivel, aiming the shuttle for its precise target in space for main engine cutoff. You'd have a good forward link now on S-10. Right, that's a good moment there, isn't it, Jim Absolutely. Riley? Yeah, you sound good. They're getting very smooth inside, and uh, they're above Mach 5 right now. That two minute and 15 second period with those solid Two minutes, 35 seconds there. into the flight. It is uh, an a much rougher ride. Discovery. It's a violent ride. And as I said, within eight seconds, they're going 100 miles an hour to give you a sense of the speed. It's hard to imagine that when you've got this four and a half million pound vehicle. Uh, at this point, it gets very smooth, and there's a constant sense of acceleration. Tell us about that. Exactly. For the next six and a half minutes, minutes after we jettison the, the uh, SRBs, then it's a uh, pretty smooth ride all the way to orbit. And right now they've just made it past the uh, two-engine TAL call for Marone, which will, if we have any kind of engine problem, then they'll, they'll abort to Marone in Spain. So in other words, they're not coming back here at this point. As they, go, as they get higher, essentially, they, the, the options for an abort get greater. Right. Yeah, in about another minute we'll hear that negative return call, which means that they have no options for coming back here and that anything happens we'll continue on and go uh, across the Atlantic. That's the four minute mark and that's an important mark. Never seen a shuttle have to do that. We're looking very closely as well as we look as, at the onboard cameras on uh, the external fuel tank for Discovery. Uh, all eyes will be trained to see if there's any debris that's come off. Have you seen any, Jim? So far it's looking very clean. All right, negative return. So if something were to happen now, it means perhaps a transatlantic abort, perhaps going to Marone, Spain, maybe an abort to orbit, which means they would get a, a lower, but a, at least an, an Earth orbit. Exactly. In fact, in about a minute, we'll hear that press to ATO, which is abort to orbit. And you got the negative return call. So they won't be coming back to RTLS. They're flying a profile, or they flew a profile that had a little less power in the equation in an effort to try to avoid uh, kicking off debris where the atmosphere is thickest. Uh, explain, does that, how much does that uh, make it more difficult to get to the space station ultimately? Of course, the slower you go, the less of a trajectory or, or an energetic trajectory you have. So they'll have a slightly different profile than most of our flights would have. In this particular case, they're going supersonic at about one minute. And that was the point where they, they actually throttle down a little earlier and throttle back up a little bit later so they could reduce the aero loads on the tank and hopefully have less 
material to be shed off of it, or less likely, likelihood of material to be shed from the tank. Now traveling in excess of 6,300 miles an hour, an altitude of 66 miles. The boundary of space is... It's roughly 60 miles. We're right there. So yep. they're in space. So, so we, you can pin astronaut wings on the rookies, the three rookies on this right now. And that's, that's a big moment when you get to space, isn't it? What's that like, that first time you get there? In fact, Steve probably made that call where he said, okay, you guys, you're all now in space. And so there are there's some big grins on the, on the flight deck and mid deck right something now. Something you've trained for years and years for, and suddenly exactly. you get those astronaut wings. We're watching that, that uh, let's look at that onboard camera as much as we can there and see what we see as it's... And here in just a minute, you'll see in the external tank camera, you'll see the orbiter actually rolled heads up at about Mach 13. Wow, let's watch that. And the, what's the reason for doing that at that point? They've been going kind of upside down almost up until that point. Yeah, one, Why? One of the big reasons is that we have a stored program command on board that will then transition from the comm here on the ground, where they're talking to ground sites, to talking to our, our antenna. Way. There uh, they go. Tennis will be talking to the satellites on board the Tedra satellites uh, here in about another 45 seconds. Yeah. So in other words, they're going from ground stations to satellites right in this moment as we see this right here. Exactly. And from here on, they'll be talking through the satellites to mission control. Looking good for discovery six That's minutes, fascinating. 11 we'll, seconds. We are now at a point, uh, we are six minutes and 20 seconds in, so about two minutes away from that external fuel tank being jettisoned. And as it goes, will we see that camera picture? Will it stay it live? It should. Last time, as I recall, it did. It was quite a spectacular picture as we saw the orbiter and the external tank separate. This is the external fuel tank, the source of all the uh, focus of all the attention and the source of uh, that foam shedding problem. It's the only piece of the shuttle combination that is not returned and reused. And uh, after, after it's used today, it uh, gets deorbited in several thousand pieces over the Indian Ocean. Yeah, what they got right now is a pressed uh, main engine cutoff, which is a good point. That means everything's looking great. Their goal for all the maneuvers that they'll do after, uh, after they reach orbit. So everything's looking great. So I, I didn't hear a single thing that uh, the Commander Steve Lindsay or uh, Mark, pilot Mark Kelly had to deal with on the way up and that was not what you would consider normal. Exactly. Everything is uh, basically looking pretty nominal so far. So all those hours in simulation wasted. <laughs> it didn't, who needs it, right? Uh, planning for all those scenarios that just didn't happen. At what point are you euphoric? Not until you unstrap and uh, start floating around? Well, the point that really uh, will get the rookies will be the point where we hit uh, main engine cutoff at Miko in about a minute. And uh, when we get that call, they will uh, be taking their helmets off shortly after that and getting the first chance to really be in zero G. Until those engines cut off, you're still getting pressed. Are you getting a lot of G-forces at this point still? Right now, they're, they're seeing uh, 3G throttling about the last minute and 50 seconds or so of the, uh, of, of, uh, the powered flight. And so you can start to see in that image a little bit of the, uh, the plasma that's being generated around the vehicle as it's continuing to fly uphill. And here, very shortly, uh, they'll hit manage and cut off in about 15 seconds. Eight minutes. So it actually generates the plasma that we associate with re-entry on ascent as well, which reminds us of how the energy is get given and taken away in spaceflight, isn't it? And even though they're fairly high right here, there's still a little bit of atmosphere, and they'll be aiming for a point to where uh, they'll in about 48 minutes after launch and main engine cutoff. All right, main the engine cutoff just reports. happened. And, and now the next moment will be the booster separation. When's that going to occur? Yes. That's pretty shortly after that. Tank separation should occur just any second now. Yeah. Just watch that. There it, there it goes. There you see Discovery and that uh, external fuel tank party company. see it company. here in just a second on the screen. And there it is. External tank separation confirmed. Commander Steve Lindsay now maneuvering Discovery to the correct orientation so that video and digital stills of the external tank can be captured by cameras embedded in the shuttle's umbilical well. A smooth ride to You're orbit. Listening for to the Rob Navy as public affairs officer in Houston, they'll also to attempt to take some pictures of handheld cameras on board, which will give them yet another opportunity to see what exactly is and is not on that external fuel tank. How much foam might have shed? Exactly. In fact, that's their very first task after this. Is that uh, you may hear a call for uh, go for the pitch maneuver, and Steve will fly the no pull the nose up. And then uh, two of the folks on the crew will then pick up a camera, both a video and a still camera, and take pictures of the, of the, the uh, external tank. 
and we'll get those down to the ground where the folks uh, back in Houston will take a good close look at them and see how it fared. We were looking closely at those pictures. We not certainly the engineers were looking closely. That's just the first indication. There's a lot of imagery all around here. Literally, uh, it'll take hours and hours to go through it all. When will we know that they had a, a nice clean? ascent and they have an orbiter that is safe to come home. It'll take a while, won't it? Yeah, I would expect the first real indications will be this afternoon in the press conference. They'll, they'll give us the first indications, but it'll take a day or so for them to actually collate all the data and get their first real good look at it. All right, we've got a quick replay here. It was really a beautiful launch on a beautiful day. The wind kind of blowing toward us, so we really got blasted and uh, rattled my bones. I don't know about yours. Uh, might have knocked a filling out or two. I don't know. Yeah, it's a, for 4th of July, that's a...